Generating traffic and sales can be a challenge for online merchants. But selling on the Walmart marketplace puts your products in front of millions of customers who shop on walmart.com. And right now, sellers who join Walmart Marketplace can save up to 50% on referral and fulfillment fees for the first 90 days. So get started today. Head over to marketplace.walmart.com slash savings. That's marketplace.walmart.com slash savings. Welcome to E-Commerce Conversations, a weekly podcast from Practical E-Commerce, hosted by entrepreneur Eric Bandholz. What is going on, Internet? Eric Bandholz back again with another E-Commerce Conversations. I hope all is going well on the other side of the Internet. On the other side of the table from me, Adam. Hello. What's up, man? <laughs> How you doing? Doing well. You don't, you don't hear a lot of intros like that? No, I was, that was, <laughs> to me by surprise, I'll be honest. I was trying to think of, am I going to, am I going to mirror this entirely? And just, we're going to do the whole podcast in that. Yeah. Yeah. That just voice. a lot of energy at the front, a lot of energy at the back. And people think it's like a high energy show. Right. Or at least that's what I tell myself when right. I do that intro. Yeah. Give our uh, listeners a quick rundown. What the hell you do? So I own a software company called retention.com. Very good domain. Start there. Yeah. And what we do is we identify your anonymous website visitors. And we're able to do two things. Mainly sell to big Shopify stores. We do two things. One, someone hits your website, they don't fill out a form and they leave. We can get an email address for that person and we can help you email them. Add them to your list, mail them in a safe way. Other thing is, using the same technology, we allow a lot more abandoned carts to go out because people are only getting those abandoned carts if they're logged in to your store, which most people are not logged into your store these days. They're logged in Amazon, Facebook, Instagram, whatever. They're not logged into like joshmosocks.com or whatever, right? Like, well, let's say uh, you, you kind of alluded to it. You got a great domain name, retention.com. Is there a story behind that? So we used to be called get emails. The only thing that we did was that first thing I described. You put a pixel on your site and we'd give you an email address of your anonymous web traffic. So a very obvious name for that yeah, is that's get, pretty good, pretty get good emails. emails. <laughs> and then we started focusing on these Shopify stores and we built the suite of bottom of the funnel products. So abandoned cart product and checkout. And all of a sudden get emails was not as appropriate. And I actually had kind of falsely analyzed the Shopify world by like kind of looking at Clavio and Yapo and stuff. I'm like, man, there's like, a multi-billion dollar opportunity for my product going after these guys, which for a lot of reasons is not completely the case. But I was like, I'm going to try to get the biggest name possible with the most authority that even kind of relates to what we're doing. And I thought retention.com was that. It's not perfect, but it kind of does that, yeah. right? Like it retains your web traffic. It's not retention how an e-commerce brand would define retention. Right. But still you see it and you're just like, I need to know what that company does. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah. did you, I assume a, a domain like that, someone was just squatting on it? Or? Yeah, uh, some woman had owned it for 29 years. Okay. And I had to get it through a friend who's like a domainer. Like, there's this world of domain. Yeah, yeah, so like, I, like I, I find that story interesting because I think a lot of our listeners may want to buy some domains down the road. So like, how do you do that? Like, you just say, hey, buddy, you know how to get domains, work your magic on this one that she's had for 30 years? So that one, so the first thing I tried to do was go through GoDaddy's domain broker service, which has worked in the past. So like, get emails, for like, instance. Like, was her contact information no. publicly available? No, 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 no. no. So, okay. So it was not. So it was privacy protected. And it was just like a 404 page if you went to retention.com. Yeah. And I went through GoDaddy's domain broker service, nothing. And then it occurred to me that I knew this guy who was a domainer. And I was like, can we get this? He's like, we can at least figure out if we can get it. You know, like for sure. He's like, I know people at all the privacy places. They can figure out who owns it. If a big company owns it, you're never going to get it. If an individual owns it, it's probably going to be very expensive. So I'm like, how expensive? And he's like, so this was last July, probably. So okay. like a little over a year ago. And he's like... I don't know, I think maybe 300 grand. He's like, if I'm trading this domain, I'm buying it at 300 and I'm selling it at 500. Yeah. He's like, that's my range. He's like, 
I think you want to be a little north of 300 and let's see if we can, you know, if an individual owns it, let's see if we can do that. So I'm like, in my mind, and, and at the time my business was in a position to where it was like, we didn't have a lot of employees. We had a lot of revenue. It's not the case anymore. We have a lot of revenue, but we have a lot of employees. <laughs> so I'm like, whatever, you know, I'll bust a month's free cash on this, right? Like, let's just do it. So two months go by and he's like, I have good news. Someone owns this. <laughs> it's not like, it's not you right. know, IBM, right? right? Or like Microsoft or Salesforce or something. He's like, the bad news is this woman thinks her domain is like priceless, oh, you know, wow. and she's taking a domain course and like whatever. So, I mean, what was it? 30 years of owning this domain. Like, did she yeah. ever have a plan for so this? The whole, is this the, her retirement? Like, yes. So the whole thing was... She, that would have so, been, so it started 29 that, years ago. That would have been like 95 or something, right? Yeah. I mean, early doors. Yeah. She bought it for nothing. Surely. Well, yeah. Right? 11 bucks or 25 yeah. bucks is what they were charging back then. 49 bucks. Yeah. And then some back and forth started and there was like, apparently there was like a deal for like 800, 850 grand a few years ago. It fell apart. Oh. And so that was this number in her head. And then eventually... He got her down to at least this is, this is what was being told to me, four fifty total, two hundred up front, two fifty in a year, and I'm like, man, <laughs> that's amazing, right? Like for this, it's just like incredible. I was thinking about it in terms of leasing it. I'm like, would I pay like twenty grand a month as like a marketing expense to just have this authority associated with my business? And I was like, yep. And then woman sleeps on it, wakes up, she says. 800 up front. That's what I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, I'm just like, oh my you God. You replied too fast. Yeah, I'm you just should have like, just been like, oh, well, no, well, that's too. Well, well they, I, I didn't even say anything. He, he called me, he, he was in Europe. He called me all excited and he's just like, dude, uh, man, I think we got this is a really good price, like 200 up front, you know, 250 in a year. I'm like, bro, like, let's sign the dotted okay. line. He's like, she's sleeping on it. And then he calls me back the next day. He's like, she woke up and she said 800 <laughs> up yeah. front. So I literally, the pain that I was in. Cause like, it's weird. These journeys you like, yeah. like I had already, you, owned, I owned it at that brain. price. Yeah. yeah, yeah you like, owned it. And I was envisioning my life with this domain at this price. And then all of a sudden it's like, we have the cash to pay for this, but I don't even know if it's responsible to like almost spend a million dollars on a domain. Like I only have six employees. Like this is so stupid or whatever. And my buddy said it like this. He's like, look, man, what were you looking to pay for it? max up front today i'm like well you said 500 so like 500 like i was totally comfortable just mm -hmm. sending that and he's like we can probably get it for 500 but in two years or like a year that's how this works yeah like you just slow roll these things he's like is it worth 300 grand to have it now and i'm like you know what it probably is so just bit the bullet yeah. <laughs> so fucking painful good but for like, her good for yeah. her to good for her hold her ground man. i know i know but it's just man but like honestly worth every penny like i have yeah. not even thought twice about it you know it's like given what i'm trying to do with it it's like well i mean i'll tell you like from my perspective as an outside party like get emails versus retention.com is like kind of a, a spammy shady exactly and then re like retention, like you said, is that, that authority you're like, oh, yeah, like yeah. I have to. It's, it's almost like the first time I heard about it is like, why haven't I heard about these guys right. before? Like I should have heard about them. Yeah. And that's how I was trying to explain it to our team internally. I'm like, basically what you're paying for is every single time someone says that name, the person they're talking to is going to think, why don't I know what they do? Yeah. How much is that worth? Yeah. Have you had any issues like trademarking? So is the company now called retention or it's called retention? I like to call it retention.com okay. just to emphasize the fact. And we got like our, I'm not even wearing a logo shirt, but we got a logo that like incorporates like the dot com and this like exclamation point at the end of it or whatever. Yeah. You gotta have uh, stickers of that, right? <laughs> <laughs> we we do. I just don't have them. So we call it retention.com. You can't actually trademark a word like right. that. It's so broad. Yeah. So, I mean, we tr you try, but yeah. you just, you just get told you can't. So yeah, you can trademark retention.com though, mm -hmm. but no one else is going right. to call it. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's kind of a, a moot point. All right. So let's get into, you know, the questions everyone wants to know, how is it legal and how, where is it not legal? Right. Or how do you make sure you stay legal? So how it is legal is number one, it's a U.S. only product. 
So the first reaction is, well, what about GDPR? It's like, well, it's not even in Europe, so GDPR doesn't apply. And it is actually where the person is in the world, what the laws that apply to them. So even a European citizen in the US, they're not subject to GDPR. Yeah. Which is just for what Sorry for all you yep. Euro listeners yeah. who wish you had privacy. Yeah. You don't. You lose it when you come here. <laughs> you don't. And then Canada also has an opt-in, like a first-party opt-in for email completely law. It's called CASL, C-A-S-L. Doesn't work in Canada either. In the U.S., the Can Spam Act of 2003, which was reviewed in 2019, says email is opt-out. Never mentions opt-ins. Yeah. So long as there's an opt-out link in your email, you can send it. Now, is that that's different than SMS? Like SMS, SMS is SMS, totally different game. Like we have an SMS audience expansion product for abandoned carts, but it's only doing cross-device ID, basically. Mm-hmm. You know, for opt-in people on your list that you have a phone number for. Right. And it works, but it's like not this. It's like something totally different. You know what I mean? Yeah. So... This is email, not SMS. The SMS laws are psychotic. The email laws are super laxed. That is just the way that it is. So you just got to make it crystal clear how easy it is to opt out. Yep. And then you just make sure you take those emails out of your list and you're good to go. I mean, Clavio does it for you, right? Effectively. So the other question is people will have is like, well, what about this California stuff? I thought that was just like GDPR. It's very similar with one critical difference. There is a federal level email law in the US that is opt out. California would love to make email opt-in. They just can't because they'll get sued under federal law. Yeah. So they have to make this law opt-out, which is what it is. It just, yeah. it just is this beautiful sort of perfect storm where it doesn't touch what we're doing. And another thing a lot of people don't realize about the CCPA or whatever is it only applies to businesses above $25 million in revenue, okay. which is interesting. I mean- It's nice for most of my listeners are probably, yeah. you know, like seven-figure businesses. Yeah. So and they think they have to worry about it, but they yeah. don't. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know? well, that's the thing is like you don't want to get above fifty employees. <laughs> I know <laughs> you, don't, you don't even want to get into forties. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let me tell you, like, how much easier your life can be, and how nice the journey can be. Yeah. By having a modestly sized business. <sighs> yeah. Without all the headaches, all the rules, the regulations. I had the best business, and now it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of us don't get in to be managers. You know, a lot right. of us get into it because we're passionate about the product. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about, you do have to update your privacy policy. Your terms. Yeah, I mean, we kind of can't force you to do it, but we tell you what to say and strongly recommend it. It's just, you should do it. I mean, you should, yeah. You should <laughs> there's be doing there's that literally no reason yeah, why yeah. you would. Yeah, yeah. I mean. But it's like kind of the type of update like the type of update you make is something that most larger brands have done already. It's like something that you would say to like make GDPR work. It's like has to do with like cookies and tracking and stuff like that. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's a sentence like that. So here's the funny thing. I'm generally one of those like privacy guys. <laughs> like you'll have to message me on signal. You yeah. Know, I should have given you my signal account right. instead of my SMS number. I got like, I use brave browser. Yeah. You know, I try to, maintain my privacy as much as possible. However, full disclosure, Beard Brand uses retention. And I think you would look at that and kind of see a little bit of hypocrisy. One of my uh, regular guests, Patrick Cadu, who has supply razors, mm-hmm. he's been on the show a couple of times, went on Twitter talking about how they're the worst because he went to some website and started getting emails from them. Yeah. And I don't know if it was, it was probably the conversation with you that might've changed my mind, but from my perspective, one of the most terrible experiences in going to e-commerce websites is these god awful spin the wheel, yeah, pop up, collect email addresses. I just hate them. I loathe them. They are a terrible experience. And it's like, can we functionally achieve the exact same thing? Email to the people with intent, not email to the people who don't have an intent, and then not bug the heck out of them and annoy them with like all these desperate pop-ups where it's like, give me your email, give me your email, give me your I, that's a strong argument. Yeah. I mean, I know I'm preaching to the choir. Yeah. So yeah. like, <laughs> well, I had never thought about it in this way, but Cody Griffin used to be the VP marketing at Dr. Squatch pointed this out. He's like, when we were looking at it, we were basically like, okay, think about what is in everybody's promotion folders in this day and age. 
if you just stuck an email from a website that you were just on in that mess of stuff, it's probably more relevant than anything else around it. Well, you know what else is the other thing that convinced me? We were running Google ads at the time that we went on to retention. And I would get customer service tickets telling me that our emails were terrible. And it's because Google will place ads in the email as well. Yeah. So it's like I'm already marketing to people's email inboxes right. through Google's ad network. Right. And, and customers think we're incompetent right. at doing emails because like whatever Google was serving right. was just horrendous. Yeah. And it was like also that point where I'm like, man, I got customers complaining about our emails. I'm going to get them real freaking emails that are good. Right. And I want to stop this like Google junk yeah. that's going to these inboxes. Mm-hmm. So that might yeah, be that's another. That's interesting. That's that, another, another, another like, angle for me to <laughs> yeah, the, a, spread the good word, right? <laughs> yeah. And it's true. Like, I mean, like at this point, like, you know, I think there's like what becomes like kind of like, ah, uh, you don't really want to do it early on becomes like standard practice and consumers are generally okay with it. Or if they're not okay with it, they implement the tools to avoid it. Like, so I use Brave Browser. Mm -hmm. I would hope and I would imagine that I'm not going to be getting these emails because of my privacy. Yeah, you can't can't have Brave. Yeah. You have the sort of cookie tracking has to be enabled. Yeah. For it to happen. So like if you don't want to be tracked, quit using Chrome because they're tracking the heck out of you. Yeah. Yeah. Basically. And then... You know, the future of all of this state-level regulation, based upon the theory that I formed from talking to a lot of privacy attorneys, is that they're not trying to do away with tracking. The argument is about whether the consumer is aware that it's happening or not. Yeah. So it's just going to end up being a lot more banners with a lot more descriptive language in them, where if people are hitting it, except... They're actually opting into stuff like this. Right. And then the problem stops. There's no liability for the brand because they're collecting consent for it. And there's no argument to be made that the customer doesn't know what's going on. Because yeah. it's like being very clearly stated that. But that it's being, at the end of the day, they're still not going to read it. Like everyone. Oh, they're, they're not going to read it. But it's. Legally it, speaking. Right. Right. It's like, it's like, it's like, up. it's like, it's the clear outcome of this. What's going to happen. Yeah. Right. So. It goes back to, I hate those pop-ups too. <laughs> so yeah. It's like, I'm not looking forward to it. Yeah. And like, I've been non-compliant. Like we don't sell to Europe currently, but even if we did or when we did, I'm, I'm not going to be compliant with those GDPR yeah. pop-ups. It's just. It's bold. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we're not selling there. Yeah. So it's like, right. at the end of the day, we're a small lifestyle business. It's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Your regulatory burden. Is very low. Is not worth it. Like, I'm just not going to deal sure. with your, you and your customers. And that's like going to be the outcome too. Like, cause when I do visit and tour in, in Europe, I'll visit some like news sites or whatever. And they're like, no, we're just not going to show you the website. <laughs> yeah. And it's crazy. So yeah, I mean, like I hate that the world is being taken over by, by everyone trying to cover their ass. I do also like want privacy protections, mm-hmm. but my personal belief is it's just get a brave browser. Like if you care about privacy, yeah, like, get the tools that protect your privacy. And if you don't care, then... You know, except that everyone's doing it. Right. My opinion is it's kind of just the way the internet works. And as time goes on and there's a generation of people that like my daughter is 13 months old, there is no way she's going to care about her online privacy. Yeah. Because she's like already like carrying our phones around and like whatever. Like I'm sure she assumes that it's reading her mind or like whatever. Right. Yeah. I mean, and it's only going to like, (laughs) Yeah, it's like only my worse. tinfoil hat is only going to get worse. Yeah. Like, like I flew to Denmark and I didn't even have to give him my passport. I just looked in the camera. Incredible. <laughs> it, yeah, it's, it's, it's like amazing. terrible. Yeah, yeah it's, t- it's amazing, but it's also yeah. terrible, you yeah. know? And then eventually is it like, Hey man, I saw you pop into like a target. I'm sure they're doing that at target. I'm like sure. you're coming to the target. We're going to face scanning and then. Well, yeah. Some alert on your phone that, mm-hmm. you know, causes you to do something or something. That certainly exists. Yeah. I think, you know, for me to sell products, it's not malicious, you know, it's mm-hmm. just another tactic. It's yeah. more of the government I, I fear. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want them to have yeah, that information. China or whatever. I mean, they're already doing all that stuff. Yeah. yeah. I mean, is it only legal here in USA or uh, exactly like what we're doing? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think that it's legal in other places. 
I'm not sure if the advertising networks that are necessary to drive it exist yeah. anywhere else other than the U S cause I'm not sure there's like the scale of population that would have like created. So you have to buy that data too, I assume, right? Yeah. We're like partnered into a bunch of different publisher networks that yeah. are kind of sending this identity signal off, which we're capturing and transferring. To our yeah. Customers. Like, do you see that or are you like the facilitator of it? So do you essentially have access to all of that? We're, a middleman in that regard. We're yeah. not like the originating business of that. It's like the data discharge right. of, of other ad networks. But I mean, like, so like, do you have to remove the email address too? Like, will customers hit up retention and be like, hey, remove my email? Oh, people rarely trace it back to us. I mean, what I would say, and I'm sure you guys have seen this, if you would ask your CS people, is that, like, you will get more people asking why you're emailing them than if you didn't do this, of course, because you're emailing a bunch of people who didn't ask you to email them. Right. We have a really elegant way of responding. It's rarely a problem, but it's typically the brand gets, you yeah. know, one email a day from somebody who's like, dude, why am I on this list? And we're like, well, you know, just tell them that trying this publisher network out, they're unsubscribed, you know, it typically goes away. If they get really mad after that, then we literally like show them the opt-in date and URL of where they opted into the publisher network. Mm. And then that shuts them up every time. It's really tough to like come back to that one. Yeah. You know, one thing that before we hit record, we wanted to address was clearly you're emailing people who didn't opt in. What about spam rates? Those are going to be slightly higher for those campaigns than sure. People who do opt in. So there is an industry wide accepted like hurdle that's one in a thousand or 0.1%. Your main list is probably well below that because just, you know, Clayview cleans it up for you, mailing over time. People unsubscribe, they complain all the time. If you're getting first party opt ins, it's probably well below that. And these emails are going to be higher than that. So, like three out of a thousand, four out of a thousand, maybe five, right? And I think that's consistent with what you've seen. The reason that's not a problem is because the way your sending reputation is evaluated is they look at all the emails that go out in the course of a day. And it's kind of the total number of spam complaints over the total number of sends of that entire body of email. And how it ends up working out with most of the brands that our product works for is the amount of new emails that we're giving a brand versus their existing traffic is like tiny. You know, yeah. it's like a couple percent per day. So even though the spam rates three or four times what it should be. You know, if it's only two percent, yeah. If you're only two percent, yeah. Everything. If you're, it's only two percent of your emails, and it literally hardly changed anything. You're right. still so far from it being a problem that it's like, and that's the whole reason it works. You could kind of think about it as email laundering. Yeah, a couple of things I want to add into this is, you know, currently we see about like 0.4 percent, and I think that might be from like some early testing where we tried to send it to people who have viewed our blog traffic. Yeah. And like get them in the funnel that way. And we found that was not a very productive use of resources. So uh, yeah, sadly, I've never seen that work because that's like the holy grail. It's, it's like, man, I got this blog track. Oh, it's tons of monetize it. this. Like, oh my God. Right. You're like, oh man, they got to be at least like somewhat warm. Like yeah. they'd be receptive. Nah. Like it was like we would send, I think we sent thousands and thousands and like, yeah. Not a single click. It's it was crazy. Like, it's like crazy. The difference how can they between, be so different? I, I know, but like it's so wild. Just the difference in intent of someone on a product page versus a blog page. It's it's wild. So we've done two flows. We have what's called um, browse abandon. So they looked at the PDPs or the website on our shop, and then we have cart abandon. So the people who added stuff to their cart, but they didn't get to the point of putting their email address in. Those are our two flows that we have going. And then it is like, obviously Beard Brand's not doing too well this year, so our numbers aren't super high, but it is like a pretty small number of sins that we're doing on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. So it's like pretty much just sending to people who are pretty high intent yeah. people. And, and that's what it's for, right? Yeah. Like, I mean. And I know some people are killing it. You probably have some like killer case studies We've kind of like, it's taken us a few months to figure that out and to work it out. Currently, our flows only have two 
emails in it. I think we're going to bump it up to like three or five to try to work those emails a little bit longer. But after that, we're going to stop sending to them. So it kind of goes along the same lines. Mm -hmm. If they're not going to purchase after five emails, yep. then kind of move on. So yep. you don't keep on sending emails to people when they don't like it or they don't respond to it. And then, yeah, we're seeing like a 4X return on investment in September. So hopefully that continues and it goes forward. But you've got some people that are absolutely crushing it on. Yeah. I mean, so like a huge business just kills it because they, you know, we, we were doing a $5,000 unlimited plan last year. So it like, you know, if you're making 150 million or whatever, and yeah. you're paying 5k, you just absolutely rock it. The other sort of, it's like you have flows set up, right? The yeah. other strategy is to just, and I'm not saying you should or shouldn't do this. I'm no. just telling. The other strategy would just be to take the contacts who hit your homepage and, or maybe like two page views or something, mix them in with your newsletter and then unsubscribe people that don't engage after like one or two sends, but keep sending to the people who do engage almost indefinitely. Yeah. And then- you basically are buying an email list right? that you're then laundering through your main list. You know what I mean? And the rate at which those contacts are coming in is low enough to where you don't even really notice the effect. Of the yeah, effect. I think, I think like we work them into our, in. our newsletter if yeah. they open if or they, they click. Yeah, 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 right, right, right. But if there's no engagement, right. we out. Well, that's right. the key to the strategy. It's like you have to take contacts out if they don't engage. You know, that's just like... And that's for people who opt in too, right. you know, it's, yeah, like, yeah. it's just like totally good email. Yeah. One thing you're also doing is you're kind of, is this still under retention, the LinkedIn deal? Oh, all this founder brand stuff I'm doing? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm doing that. It is totally for this. Yeah. It's the only reason I'm doing it kind of thing. Like not specifically for e-com, but like to grow this business is the reason that I started. No, I'm talking about like your B2B Oh, is right. that public? Can yeah, I talk about yeah, 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 yeah. Totally, totally. Okay. okay. So, yeah, 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 a separate. I thought you were talking about. Yeah, my founder, I, think I, I thought you were talking about my th founder brand content on LinkedIn. Yeah, no, no, no. You can follow him on LinkedIn. He he posts stuff there. But I wanted to talk about like because this and how we use it is direct to consumer. So right. collecting consumers' email mm -hmm. addresses. You also have a solution for like agencies or people who work business to business to right. help them out. Also under retention, right? Yep. We're going to call it retention B2B. We're okay. starting with B2B, SaaS, so like software companies like us or whatever. So software companies that have like three salespeople or more and get a couple thousand visits a month or whatever. We can give the sales team LinkedIn URLs of like half the people that are visiting the site with all of the page view history that they engaged in in that session. Yeah. which is amazing. That's kind of different than we, we tell you the landing page, but you don't really need to know the page view history because of like, the up, it's just a different product than the, the DC one. Yeah. But yeah, I'm excited. It's a really valuable list that their sales teams don't have yet. Yeah. I and, can see why somebody would want that. And again, like super warm leads versus the highest intent you're going to get, you know, the leads that these teams are working are not nearly this good in my opinion. Anything we can do to make cold calling better? Oh, less cold. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah, I mean, like, so if the, the salespeople aren't wasting their time, you know, like, literally on LinkedIn finding the newest hack to get yeah. CEOs to reply to their emails mm -hmm. and emailing people who have intent, that would be great. Yeah. When does that launch or has it already launched? We are, man, we should have, like, a little very light V1 next week or something you can hit me up on linkedin and tell me if you sort of fit that yeah fit that ideal customer profile i want to try it we have some early beta testers now but we're like kind of trying to get like 100 or something starting yeah. next week and then i guess that's a deal you worked out with linkedin like do you no it's they kind of don't have anything to do with it a lot of people have databases that are linkage between a LinkedIn URL and a consumer email. So that's yeah. kind of what we're doing. We're compiling. It's like we're still doing the de-anonymization of the traffic to a consumer email, but then we're making our own LinkedIn database. Yeah. So. Oh, that's exciting, man. Yeah. It's just something totally. <laughs> what did you do before this? This retention.com yeah. is a spin out of an email newsletter app, which I started in 2014. That was like my first attempt to start a tech company. That was a terrible space. It was so hard. I mean, if you can 
competing with MailChimp and yeah. Clavio. I mean, people don't even realize that Clavio has competitors. That's how dominant they are. Yeah. <laughs> it's unbelievable. You know, like in the most commoditized space it's, that exists in the internet almost, email marketing's been around forever. So I really struggled for a lot of years. That was like a lifestyle business, which was really nice, but it was shrinking, which is not nice. Yeah. <laughs> like lifestyle businesses are great until you're looking at it and you're like, holy shit, if I don't figure something else out, like, I don't know what I'm going to do. Yeah. So this was big attempt number three at doing something that MailChimp wasn't doing. Yeah. I was like, man. So this but, was like a feature you're going to Yeah, literally, I was like, this will be why people will use my email app yeah. because I have this identity feature. And the cooler part I thought was, this is pretty nuanced, but like in email, there's this self-regulatory deliverability organization. That's a lot of big words. But- Deliverability is the art and science of inboxing. The big companies have to be in this organization because they need a direct line into Gmail. If MailChimp gets blocked globally, they need someone to call over there. Yeah. So they're all in this big organization. You can't be in that organization if you sell data. So I was like, I have found a feature that has got to be valuable that no one else can replicate because they have to be in this organization. Surely everyone's going to use my email app. You know what happened? People would sign up, use the identity feature, download it, put it in Clavio. Mm. <laughs> and they said it was awesome. Yeah. So I was like, all right, well, I got to spin this out, connect it to everything, and then get rid of that other company. And, yeah. You know, and that's how it started. Uh, and funny. then I tried to make it a lifestyle business for two and a half years. And then for some stupid fucking reason, I tried to go big. Yeah. I don't know why. Did you raise money and all that stuff? No, I still haven't raised money, which is great. Yeah. And we went through a period of like, we hired, we went from like fifth, six to 50 people like really quickly in like a couple months. And then I was spending money on all sorts of other events and newsletter sponsorships trying to just like get out there. And we sort of went a little too far, paired back a little bit, and now we're in a really good spot where yeah. it's like we're quite profitable again, still growing nicely. That was a period of extreme discomfort. It's like, yeah. I don't know how people burn dough and like sleep at night. Like it's, I can't. Even breaking even for me was like extraordinarily painful. Yeah. Bootstrap yeah. our life. Yeah. Bootstrap Dude. our life, man. Totally. I would imagine like you've got to get imitators now, people who are inspired by your technology. Yeah, it's not super hard. Like it was really hard for me to figure out how it worked because no one else was doing it. But like I'm yelling about how it works and I'm yeah. yelling about how well we're doing. So people are popping up all the time. I kind of think the world is just becoming more commoditized and I'm really trying to focus on brand and trust. Yeah. Like, you know. so what is that? I mean, for us, you know, again, from our experiences, it was, I want to call it a white glove, but it was like a very hands-on, mm -hmm. like helping us out, figuring out the flows that would work the best, figuring out the audiences yeah. that work the best. So we did get a lot of support from your team yeah. in setting up. Um, yeah, that's, that's hard to compete with, but strangely, what's even hard, this isn't really a product that's like, you're going to raise you know, you wouldn't start this company, get a little traction and be able to raise like $50 million of VC. It's just a weird space. Yeah. There's a lot of like, it's risky. I may, like yeah, I may be able to get private equity growth capital at some point, but it's somebody who understands that they are taking regulatory risk in exchange for very compelling competitive dynamics. Yeah. You know what I mean? A VC is like not going to do that. Right? right. So it's like new people pop up, but I view our competitive advantage as, you know, I've developed this, I have 50,000 followers on LinkedIn. That's not like you on YouTube, but like it's a lot on LinkedIn. And I'm creating a media brand that's basically broadcasting all of these really cool small events that we do and creating the perception that we're everywhere all the time. Because I think that that's the hardest thing to compete with, the illusion that you're a large company in our space. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't even think anyone could make the illusion, let alone be doing what we're doing. You know, it's like, there's this weird thing where like, I think with these big Shopify stores, you can get to a certain point, just you and your laptop, but like there's this next level you have to get to, to get a lot of them where you have to be doing this in-person selling motion and it takes 20 people and it takes a million dollars a year yeah. of, you know, it's you're sponsoring events and you're doing dinners and you're just, you have people everywhere and they're flying everywhere and like whatever. And that's like a, that's a hard place to bootstrap to. Yeah. I was like really lucky that I had a ton of free cash to spend at that. And your other option is you go raise money in a hard environment when you haven't figured out the sales model yet and you have to get it right the first time, which doesn't feel great either. <laughs> you know what I mean?
And this other dynamic where I'm trying to differentiate is like, this is an inherent, I mean, we're talking about what the product is. It's an inherently untrustworthy right. conversation we're having. It's like, well, what do you mean you can do that? Like, what else are you doing? <laughs> so it's like, I'm trying to be the most unbelievably transparent person to be the most trusted entity in this untrustworthy space. So like, I do build in public, show our financials every yeah. month. Like, it's just crazy level of business yeah. updates and everything. It's Encourage everyone yeah. to update their privacy policy. Yeah, 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 that you know, too, just yeah. Just do it the right way yeah. and, you know, like, sweet, man. Well, where, where can people support you? I guess, yeah. Probably. Yeah, so like the website's retention.com. Check it out. Mm -hmm. We're going to drop a free Shopify app soon that just does like one of those things. So it's like abandoned cart flow only for free that anybody can come up and just see how it works. Yeah. So that's cool. Check that out in maybe like eight weeks. Retention.com is a website. I make a lot of content on LinkedIn. Retention Adam is my handle. I'm making a weekly docu-series chronicling this journey of my idiocy of like going from having the best life ever to like <laughs> banging my head against the wall every day. And uh, you know, I like it. It's sort of fun to watch it play out. So that's on the LinkedIn page too. Sweet. Yeah. Well, it's been uh, fun having you in the Beard Brand office. Thanks for swinging by and sharing your story. I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I did. This has been another e-commerce conversations. Cheers. Keep on growing. <laughs> <laughs>